Welcome back to New Rockstars. This is The Big Question, the show that gives you too much information about how all of society shutting down is scary, but not as scary as everyone suddenly flooding back into it. <laughs> You. We're talking about fictional worlds, <laughs> uh, as always. I'm Eric Voss here with Philip Molina. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing good. Real quick, you just reminded me that rewatching Endgame recently. When, so if you guys are doing our rewatches with us too, you'll notice everything about Endgame predicted everything about coronavirus and quarantine. Yeah. It's cr it's crazy. Like once you rewatch it, it, there are so many similarities. Actually, we're gonna get into some of them, but there's so many more when you actually watch it. It's insane. They knew the whole time and they did nothing. The whole time. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, God. Well, they tried to warn us, and our Infinity Saga rewatch did just reach Infinity War, Thanos dusted half of all life, and yeah, this blip that we're now in is going to last another five years until everything changes in Endgame. It's, it's familiar. It's eerily familiar. So, Philip, let's, let's ask the big question today. What would the real-world implications be, not just for the snap, but for this awkward, sudden return of everyone who dusted? Let's get into some snap-locations and some biplications, which I know are fake words that you love. I, I think the second one means the implications of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> we are living in the biplications as we speak. <laughs> yeah. This is the end games. Yeah. I do, I want to acknowledge a lot of people are going to be like, uh, this topic's been covered before. We know what happens. There's plenty of business insider articles are written about the implications. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. First of all, they're not caught up all the way through Far From Home, yeah. uh, which I'm going to try to be more caught up. But second, they really phoned it in on the blip side of it. So like Eric said, it gets way more interesting when you think about everybody coming back and also why Tony Stark may be a terrorist. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. But let's get into Whoa, it. Oh, yes. So uh, every week we just accuse him of terrorism. <laughs> we'll get him. Well, and you can accuse the dead of anything. It's legal. That's right. They can't sue you. I'm going to break this down into the snap and the blip. Those are the official terms, right? The snap is the dusting and the blip is the return. So we're going to start with the snap and talk about its implications. And I'm going to try to skip most of the stuff that we already know. Like, for instance, the snap's effects on the environment. We'll go through this just really quick. The environment would thrive, never been better. Yes. Mm. Al Gore is so just well. dabbing everywhere. And then he's sort of dusty and that's what Oh crap, I'm one of them. <laughs> the whales in the Hudson, right, is, yes. is the line we learn in the end game. And that's actually crazily supposedly happening right now. Uh, people said that they saw dolphins in the Venice canals, which sounds oh, like yeah. a lie, but I really want to go there still. Please, I come back to our country. <laughs> it was a dolphin wearing like a striped shirt, like with a gondola. I'm like, <laughs> I thought you said for a second with a gun. Get on my gondola! Get on the gondola! <laughs> <laughs> He has both. <laughs> but what is totally true is that that would totally would happen because you might have just seen this this week. They announced that carbon emissions in our world right now are down 17%, which wow. might not sound like the craziest amount, but that's a fifth of the carbon emissions are gone. It is at the lowest rate since World War II. Wow. After everyone was nuked. Yeah, exactly, which is also a terrible time. The world is able to finally like take a breath, and that would definitely happen post snap so let's just move yeah. on past the environment and move on to what really moves the wheel the economy money money please oh, thank you. what we've learned in real life is that some people put the economy above everything money please so this is actually how we would feel the effects of this snap immediately post snap there would be a lot of reshuffling of the economy. There would be a huge stock market crash. Yeah. It would be a lot like what we saw as coronavirus was kind of uh, hitting hard. We immediately saw that the stock market every day was getting worse. It was similar post 9-11. This is what happens post tragedies. A lot of people yeah. are just worried that we're never gonna rebound mm -hmm. um, and that they're gonna lose a lot of money. But then let's look into further implications beyond that first day. First of all, the workforce, the available people to work Right now we're dealing with very limited workforce that's in those essential roles. Here's what's interesting about the way Thanos did it. So he picks half of life to be gone. And he theoretically does it completely at random unless he like really doesn't like Al Gore or Ronald McDonald or something to make sure like they're definitely on the right side. And you could say that the genders is probably roughly equal. I believe there's a little bit more women than men on earth, but basically it evens out to about 50-50 there. So there's not gonna be much of an issue there but each life, no matter their age, counts the same. And most people alive today are between the ages of 15 and 45. 
Mm -hmm. So that's the section that would see the, the biggest loss. The ratios would be the same per each thing, but we would lose millions and millions and millions and millions of people uh, between 15 and 45. Mm -hmm. And why that matters and why it doesn't matter that the ratios stay the same, but that we lose so much from that sector is people between 15 and 45 are the group that are primarily only able to do certain jobs. There are jobs that, they're, that are from before their time and there are jobs that are probably after their time, but there's a group of jobs, this is kind of like our age people. We're somewhere between 15 and 45 and we'll never tell which side of that we're closer to. <laughs> and don't ask. One of us is, is on one end and one of us is on the <laughs> yeah. other end. What that means is that people that are in this middle group represent entire industries. Uh, and so the perfect example that I could think of is the social media Baby manager. Babysitters. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, no. No, babysitters abound. A anyone can, can watch a baby, you just, Sip a beer and make sure it's not near a, a fire. But Stacy but, from Babysitter's Club did get dusted. Yeah. Uh, but voluntarily. Hmm. She had diabetes. <laughs> That's not what dusting is. She was already on her way out, is what I'm saying. <laughs> she dusted into sugar. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so... <laughs> That's the mean joke. But social media managers is what I was thinking of, right? Those are people who... There's no one over 45 who's a social media manager. And, you know, there's not really, like, middle school kids, so they're, they're more qualified uh, than the rest of us to do it. Uh, so that's a whole field that would just go away. And, I mean, you might think that doesn't matter, but, I mean, that's where the quick 24-hour coupon codes get shared. Oh, yeah. uh, that's who apologizes when a company says something really insensitive. Uh -huh. And you know how many companies would be making commercials about the snap where it's like, get a Coke for your friend who's gone now or something, you know, like <laughs> there definitely would be a lot of uh, things to apologize for. And so the companies just wouldn't be able to communicate with people as effectively, which would negatively impact them. But also let's remember that there are certain jobs that only exist in that older group, the over 45 people who, if, if, even though it's a smaller group of people, there's not many people doing those jobs. So those are completely gone now too. So we got no Walmart greeters. <laughs> Oh, it's completely done. And also, nobody knows how to operate a radio station. It's just beyond oh everyone. Where will you get your golden oldies? I believe every radio station is just operated by Eternals. You're wondering where the Eternals are. They're running KCRW. With those smooth, chocolatey voices. <laughs> Back to you. Steve um, Inskeep. <laughs> weird name. Steve Inskeep somewhere is like, ah! My ears are burning, because they're on fire! Like that baby. So, realistically though, as I did more research about these jobs and what happens in these times of crises, those jobs, honestly, would be gone anyway because the workforce would get consolidated into the roles that are considered essential. Mm. So that means somebody like a plastic surgeon would have to just become a general practitioner yeah. in order to make it for all the missing doctors. Fancy chef would have to become just like a general line cook to make sure people are fed. A high-end escort would have to settle for like sad saps that just want someone to cry on. <laughs> so basically this means entire sectors of the economy and the workforce would just be gone wiped out industries would be gone. But the government actually has a record of how to behave in situations like this. And this is actually what I'm very much hoping, legitimately hoping happens now. And it's the same thing that happened in response to the Great Depression and that's the New Deal. So the New Deal was an effort to pull people out of the situation by giving them opportunities and building new industries that maybe weren't needed before or investment in infrastructure. So what would probably happen is a lot of people would start getting trained in new jobs where suddenly there's a bunch of openings because of the snap, remember? And there'd be lots of investing in um, exciting new new things. Whole new forms of insurance would probably exist. Oh, sure, yeah. Dust yeah. insurance. When you have too much <laughs> dust in your uh, laundry filter. Where did all this extra <laughs> dust come from? And also, where's my husband? So, in that end, we actually would start to kind of future-proof the economy and it would take some leaps in industry, so that actually could be kind of interesting. And then if you stay on that path, you realize Thanos wasn't totally wrong. <laughs> Thanos did nothing wrong meme immediately. On, on the I knew we'd uh, get there. Gonna get there because it's really easy to start doing that math. Rent, the cost of rent just plummets. Ooh. There'd be a tremendous oversupply of housing and people would also have more disposable income because they don't have dependents, children to feed anymore. They don't have girlfriends to buy gifts for and 
wives to buy gifts to make up for the girlfriend? Yeah, I got them. Hey, go, go. Get up, camera. Also, your general pay would actually go up. There are less people that are qualified for your job now, and a lot of people have to get immediately promoted because their boss turned to dust. That's right. Thanos didn't snap half the monies away. And <laughs> yeah. since I assume we're still on the for gold the standard, it's not like he gold fingered the, the gold that our money's based on. Uh-oh, I, I feel like I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> Does the Federal Reserve adjust interest rates and that, uh, uh, they print currency and inflation? And... They just made a trillion dollars. So yeah, I think you, that's basically, it works like magic. Got it, great, yes. Yeah. But you're basically right. The money is there for the taking and people would start making more money each one. So as we kind of got over the awkward phase, people would start buying things like crazy. Uh, and a lot of those things would be cheaper because there'd be too much supply, so it'd be like clearance sales. So the economy actually would rebound in not too long. Moving on, the government response. So <laughs> this I'm learning based on the way things are going right now. A lot of uh, the government's initial response would be, what other government should we blame for this? <laughs> yep. I thought about this, and actually it's pretty easy to think of who would take all the blame. Wakanda. Oh yeah. And it's not just because of racist reasons. You gotta think about the timing. There was a secret country <laughs> that nobody knew about that had crazy weird technology that nobody knew about. And then some essential battle that had ramifications throughout the universe took place in Wakanda. And then suddenly half of everyone is gone. It just seems kind of convenient. Conspiracy theorists, 100, Alex Jones would be like thriving in this world. Yeah, and in the MCU's version of Alex Jones is of course J. Jonah Jameson. He'd there be all over this. Yeah, for sure. And the fact that Vision walked around with one of these things in his head and then they harbored and sheltered this piece of crap in their country and lured Thanos to Earth. And that street food. And that like street food. Like they've just been food. hiding that street food. But you know, if they got a taste of that street food, they might not be as bad at, at Wakanda. <laughs> Is that street food? Oh, mm, mm, so good. The secret ingredient <laughs> is vibranium. They just sprinkle vibranium on it. Tastes great. Bam, 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 bam. It makes my teeth itch. Not the heart shaped herb. That's edible. Vibranium. <laughs> so, our country would probably have issues with another country and a lot of countries. Maybe there'd be a little bit of shakeup, but it doesn't matter because democracy would die. <laughs> because if you think about it, voting doesn't actually do well on the other side of a crisis that there's no response to. And what that means is when we're at war, that feels like a crisis, or right now we're in the middle of a crisis, and it feels like the government has a role to play in this. So a lot of people are gonna motivate their vote based on what the government might do to help them. Except the snap, the government is completely helpless. Your vote means nothing. It will not bring back your math teacher, who apparently you <laughs> care a lot about. So democracy would suffer and because the economy would be in turmoil for a bit there and people would be kind of freaking out. Decent chance that an authoritarian government actually would act much faster and kind of kick in faster. And that's what we might be seeing right now too, is that supposedly some of these author authoritarian governments were able to flatten the curve very quickly because they were just like, stay home. And they're like, yeah, we, you don't got to tell us twice. Yeah. Authoritarian. I mean, hey, that's what happened uh, in the early 20th century with Spanish flu after the huge depression that hit the industrialized world after World War I. A lot of uh, fascist regimes rose in that time because they were able to promise security and people people bought into it. I mean, it's in yeah. the, a new deal. Like we had a depression here in the 30s and FDR was able to give a lot of power to like the executive branch away from the legislative branch just because he was able to justify it as like, we're in a national crisis right now. And what's crazy is it worked. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so people wouldn't have these great arguments against fascism theoretically uh, because it works. Uh, yeah. Man, I'm just saying, if Thanos did nothing wrong, fascism works. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing great here. In fact, we actually do have, according to Black Widow in Endgame, what the government's real response was to the snap. And I think this shows you how ineffective they are at helping. Their immediate response to the governments around the world was to conduct a census. That's what their response was. That's the only really concrete detail we, we got so far of what they did. They're counting how many adults are out there and how many kids are out there. Hey, Philip, a census is a very, very important thing and everyone should take part in yes. it. Yes, the census is very important. Post-snap, a little weird to, to prioritize, but actually, I'm, I tried to come up with like, why would they prioritize the census? Just because like, they want to count to three billion and confirm it's, oh, it is exactly 50%, how weird. I'm gonna, 
think that what they really mean by census is they're trying to figure out one, who's gone, but two, what kids are suddenly orphaned and literally alone yeah. in their homes. Hello. So I actually imagine that census workers could be part of this new workforce, part of New Deal, just going out there and knocking on doors and trying to find children who suddenly don't have parents at all. <laughs> So it's not the worst idea if you think of it that way. Now, what would happen to these kids, right? What the government would do with them, we've kind of seen versions of this, both with, with immigrants or relocations of people. So the children would probably get put in centers. That, that said, there's so many of them that they'd have to retrofit other centers. So probably hotels mm. would get turned into homes for children. Two scoops, sir. Two, make it three. I'm not driving. Uh, schools, school was canceled for a bit, so those would be turned into homes. This is sounding pretty great so far for the kids. No school, live in a hotel. Well, I was gonna say also likely they'd overflow into private detention centers, so essentially Ooh, jails would get that's converted. That's not fun. But that is kind of how it works. But here is what's what's interesting. Then the next step, once they collect all these kids, is to try to relocate them into actual homes. And first, they would try to put them in with relatives, right? If you have right. a relative out there, you're gonna go live with them. But there's gonna be so many kids that they can't find the relative. They have no living relatives. Their relatives suck. Yeah, my relative's a YouTuber. Like, <laughs> that's a child endangerment right there. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> what that would result in as they're trying to get people out of these large centers is the largest foster care system we've ever had where millions of kids are put into foster care and that might sound terrible when we think about foster care and all those little kids singing tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. But, silver lining here, there would be millions of parents who have suddenly lost a child and they've got a child-sized hole in their apartment, a bedroom, a bed, clothes that they kind of wish they could be making use of. Because they threw the last kid out of the wall and then it formed a, a hole the size of the kid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The kid ran through the wall really fast. <laughs> but really, like, it actually would be this sweet thing where these two people who have lost, like, the most important person in their life would probably come together. And so adoption rates would also be higher than they ever have been, yeah. too. So... Not the worst thing, and maybe the people that are able to adopt, again, might sometimes make, this is true for a lot of people, sometimes they make better parents than the ones that had to give them up. Of course, these people didn't give them up by choice, but people that welcome children into their homes, I was gonna say usually good people, but uh, that, that could go the exact wrong direction. Not an It Takes Two, starring Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. There was a family who just kept adopting kids and made them work in a junkyard. Yeah, but remember in this scenario, it's just Ashley Olsen. So speaking of just kind of families and human relationships, next section, human relationships. Mm. This is what I know nothing about. Although I do know about awkward relationships and that actually is the first thing that immediately happens post snap. It's just so uncomfortable for family to deal with and not just the death of a family member. A lot of people put like the extreme, what if you were doing this? What if you were doing that? Think of the simplest version of you're sitting on your couch watching TV with a family member and they turn to a pile of dust. That relationship you now have with this person is so uncomfortable because you're like literally do I get a dustpan and have to and scoop them into something that is a little nicer do I make sure the cat doesn't see this pile of dust and make use of it oh my God. <laughs> immediate effects is just so awkward and uncomfortable and that is probably the worst moment of everyone living's life but some time passes and now you got kind of some opportunities. So actually, if you think about it, there's a lot of new young widows out there, a lot of new young widowers. They're looking for someone who knows what they've been through. And then on top of that, not only is there suddenly a lot of people are suddenly single and eager to mingle. Oh my God. But dating has never been better. You don't need reservations to go to any restaurant. They're completely available. Uh, you can get tickets to Hamilton the night of uh, and get front row probably and they're super cheap. That's assuming the cast didn't dust, Philip. No, hello, Broadway understudies, Eric? How dare you be such a snob? Do you walk out when it's not Lin-Manuel? I do. When I get that insert in the playbill, I tear up the playbill and I say, this is not what I paid for. And then people are like, that's a performance. And yes. then you get up on stage. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously, what's the deal with understudies? And then you're fighting with the, with the cellist. 
And he's got that sword. For a whole other reason you have a fight with this cellist though. I won't be speaking of that. By the way, they don't play with a sword. It's a sword. It's sharp. <laughs> well then he should tune it. All right, I'm sorry about that. What I'm basically saying is dating would be great. And then also this idea of starting a new, people would take this opportunity to, I'm kind of doing this with what we're going through right now. You kind of get like this blank slate and you can start over and then you kind of can see it from Mr. Harrington's wife's perspective where if you were unhappy <laughs> with your life, this is an opportunity to kind of start over. Of course, you don't have to pretend that you were dusted, but she did. Did I tell you how my wife pretended to blip out? Turns out she ran off with a guy in her hiking group. But a lot of people would be doing that and basically people would be living as their authentic selves for the first time and i mean to the extreme a whole segment of the population would become hedonistic as hell we're talking like hedonism bot fed on grapes sucking off uh pineapples i apologize for nothing there would be end times level of partying right end of the world kind of parties and uh -huh. That sounds hella fun. As long as everyone is playing by the same rules and they're all game and it doesn't get too out of control. Cause you know, historically speaking, debauchery hasn't Boo, been good get him for... off stage. Boo, this guy sucks. <laughs> get out of here, cellist. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Use your sword. I'm just saying debauchery is not always safe for everybody. Sometimes it's just certain. Oh, when Sodom and Gomorrah. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Is that what it is, Gomorrah? Why Gamora? That's why I my mind always mixes up Gamora and Nebula's name. Even though I know there I know who is who. It's just like the bad one is Nebula, which is confusing because Gamora is the more good character, but she's associated with a biblically bad thing. Yeah. How funny would it be if Thanos was like, My daughter's Gamora and Sodomy? Well, hello, boys. <laughs> it's like I'm still a stern robot. Uh, that's the snap, and I think we kind of understand what a lovely place to live in if you are one of the lucky 50-50s. If the gangs haven't seized your property and murdered you by now, sure. There's no gangs. Everybody came together into one peaceful gang called okay. the human race. Sure, all right. <laughs> or the gangbang in the hedonistic parties, which also, great. Now let's talk about the ramifications of three billion people coming back. All of a sudden, <laughs> at a moment's notice, in the speed of a snap, the blip, it doesn't go well. We're gonna start bad and we're just gonna get worse. So first, let's just talk about these, and some people are just uh, asking about these a lot, just these little weird, uncomfortable scenarios, and these are some of the ones that have kind of been addressed, so like the environment, I'm coming to go through these quickly. We saw that basketball team kind of suddenly reappear with the marching band yeah. uh, in Spider-Man. <laughs> They called it the blip. So that tells us that you returned to the last location you were in. A lot of people are like, what if you were in the middle of a surgery and you're suddenly back there and you're, you have a gaping hole and you bleed out and you die? The famous one, what if you were in a plane? And right. that plane's not there anymore when you reappear. This has been answered uh, by the Russos, it's been confirmed just on the Marvel side. Hulk snap was not, everybody come back. It's everybody come back real safely. Specifically a safe return for the people that came back. But there's no way that the Hulk went through every scenario and was like, and also let's not make it like awkward or uncomfortable for anyone. They just said safe. So let's stay on that plane one for a second, right? You were in the air, you suddenly are brought back, but it knows, well, you'll die if you stay there. Let's even just conclude the logical next place. Let's take them to their gate of destination at the airport that they were headed to. Imagine half the people that were on a plane, so what is that? 200 people, 250 people, so 125 people, suddenly in one moment appear at a gate all at once, which probably already has a whole plane's worth of people ready to leave. Not only is it just like a pile of people, like, like people are breaking legs, people oh, are yeah. kissing inadvertently and falling in love and having to leave their families. But I've seen what we could be like together, and I choose us. Please, Kate. One cup of coffee. You can always go to Paris. Just, please. I wanna try again. I mean our marriage. F you. I hated your hair. I hated your ugly legs, your forearms. I hated kissing your lips, Dave, okay? And that's why I lacked enthusiasm when your cock was in my mouth. It is just an insane pile of people. 
I think that is happening all over the place. There's no way this is slick. The easiest, smallest stakes one is one of the most uncomfortable. You got snapped and you got dusted while you were on a public toilet. Sitting on toilet. Uh oh. It is safe for you to sit in someone else's lap on a public toilet. No matter what the teachers say, it is safe. But it's not comfy. Absolutely, I'll say, I'll throw it out there, one million people probably landed on the lap of somebody else who was already pooping. Decent chance the person that landed on top also pooping. You know what confuses me is just the simple physics of how you return. Is it redusting, just manifesting now, occupying the space you once were? You're not dropping. You're just like <gasps> appearing. What if you're inside someone else in that moment? Is it just like the boys and they just splatter their blood and guts everywhere? <laughs> there are gonna be some implications like that, but I'll say that you're not coming back from the dust you were because nobody is near themselves anymore, right? So much okay. of the dust we saw went into the wind. Uh -huh. So it doesn't like bring it all the way back. It just kind of snaps that person back Got it. Uh, as a whole unit. So let's go back again to the category that I said mattered more than anything, money. Yes. The economy. Get back to that money. Everyone's back, there should be so many consumers, right? No, immediately everything gets way worse. Things are okay. worse than ever. Remember, there was there more than enough housing for all those people that were left behind. And then theoretically, well, that same amount of housing should still be there, so there should be housing for everyone, except millions and millions of people would blip back into existence, into an apartment or a place they rent <laughs> that now has new tenants. Oh yeah, it's like a Back to the Future. The guy's gonna come up with, yeah, a, exactly. with a baseball it's bat. Yeah, exactly. like, who the hell are you? A lot of people shot on sight, just immediately. But also, yeah, you got snapped back. Mm. Yeah, okay. Get out of my kid's uh, bedroom. What are you doing in my daughter's bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> now, considering that it's been five years, right? It hasn't even been just a few months. It's been five years. It's very, very rare for a resident to have a lease that lasts that long. So almost no one has a scenario where they are still the tenant of that rental property. Yeah, all the people not living in rent-controlled apartments, uh, you're gonna have someone pop into your life now. Can two clip men share an apartment without driving each other crazy? Even in the rent-controlled ones, because they didn't, they didn't continue to renew their lease. Oh, that's right. So the courts would find there would be no right for that person to keep that home anymore. It's the same thing as if you faked your death or disappeared or something. After a certain amount of time, the contract is void. So you also uh, better believe that not only do they not have a home now, but also when they're like, well, it's fine. I'll, I'll quickly put a deposit on a new place. All of their assets are at best frozen. That's the best case scenario where the bank is like, you're gone, we're not giving you this money. Unless they had a will or something that they could give it to their, you know, Which is next not a better case scenario. Even if they're not frozen assets, even if it's not a will, the redistribution of the person's individual wealth would go to other people. In five years, do you think those people didn't just spend it? You think they're just like sitting on it like, thank God I knew you would come back in five years. Here's all your money back plus interest. No, that money's gone. Yeah, especially Done. if they were like their spouse was the primary earner. They're going to need that money in order to like, exactly. you know, keep their life going. So it's like, well, man, they're in a tough spot, this person that came back. They better quickly get back to work and not mourn, except they don't have a job anymore. Oh. There is huge, tremendous, unprecedented unemployment they're not gonna get their old jobs back because either the company went under because of the snap or the company had to move on and has since replaced that employee. It leads me to what would immediately happen. Starvation would start to kick in. No, and this good. isn't just because these people are now homeless and jobless. It's because like you're saying, there's not enough food. The demand of the world's food supply would suddenly double double in demand. But also you might think, well, we were saying earlier, things cost less because there's this overabundance of supplies. But it's been five years now. So we've used up that abundance of supplies and then we stopped manufacturing to that level of people because we didn't expect them to come back. So there is not enough supplies. We'd run out of nearly everything immediately and eventually we would catch back up, but not in time for people not to starve. Also, very important, immediately run out of toilet paper. That's a given, oh, we yeah, now know yeah. that. We saw how yeah. quick that happened. <laughs> just, just a little hiccup. Somebody sneezed and <laughs> then it was like, my store was sold out of toilet paper immediately. <laughs> and you might be thinking, oh, Philip is forgetting that suddenly there's twice as many cows and pigs and chickens, right? That there's a lot of meat suddenly available because the livestock had been dusted too, kind of. It does come back, but the amount of time that passes from farm to table is too long to keep someone alive if they literally have nothing to eat. And it's even worse than normal 
Because remember, there's so much less infrastructure now, less employees, right, right, right. less equipment. They can't actually handle this tremendous yeah. amount. When they have too much of it, they usually have to actually put those animals down. They got to put it down or they got to throw it away or they got to, yeah, they, they need people to process and ship it. Yeah, I saw somebody throw a cow away in the dumpster recently. Yeah, but that cow was being a huge asshole. Yeah, we're like out of food immediately. At least they have their loved ones back. No, personal relationships, families, they don't. Their spouses have also, like their jobs, moved on. Many of these people in five years, remember I said dating would be amazing and there's people looking for love again? Many of these people have now remarried and suddenly their original spouse returns and might think, well, like, you know, I was there first or something. This has actually happened before in the United States even during wartime. A number of soldiers are declared dead or missing in action and they stop looking for them. People get remarried and then the person comes back and it gets very complicated. There actually isn't yeah. a clear uh, answer to it. You have to deal with it and you can't pick both because legally you're not allowed to be married to more than one person at a time. So either way, a beautiful love-filled marriage is ruined one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Five years later, if we knew someone who didn't move on, who was still just hoping that some Avengers might figure out a way to turn back time, we'd call those people crazy. Be like, yeah. move on with your life. Like, it sucks, but it's been five years. Now, Karen, it was two weeks and you already had a new husband. I mean, remember also uh, those sweet adopted kids who found a kind of adoptive parent and recreated a, a new bond that they needed. They're in an even worse situation about this now because suddenly a kid appears in this bedroom and is like, who the hell are you? He also has a shotgun. <laughs> what are you doing in my room wearing my clothes, calling my parents mom and dad? And those kids themselves who have now come to find this wonderful parent who took them in, spent five years bonding with them, those kids the courts would find, they're still technically custody to their original parents who are now back. So they will all be gathered up, there'll be trucks, there'll be SWAT teams, it'll be like Aww. the Elian Gonzalez case, exactly Aww. like that, busting in because the kid wants to stay and they're gonna rip him out of an auntie's arms and send him back to his creepy old undusty uncle. Who's, who's younger than they should be. Who's not ready to take care of kids. And just staying here in these tragic family situations, it gets worse, Eric. How? Okay, this one's so bad. I hate this implication, but it would totally happen. The snap has been undone. It's now the blip. They're coming back. The three billion people are coming back. A part of you, I'm getting goosebumps even just thinking about this, right? You're just like, holy crap, it's all done. My Daniel's coming home to me. Except there's going to be so many instances where people died because of the snap, oh. as a result of the snap, but not that they were dusted, but that something happened because of that. Perfect example, the post credit scene of Infinity War, that helicopter slamming into that building, 28 people dead probably. Oh, we undid the snap. The Hulk brought everybody back. It's like, oh my God, Daniel, he's back. Oh no, he didn't like undo like funny deaths. Where do you think you're going? He only undid the dusty ones. Yeah, the so car all accidents. these people are gonna get their hopes up. Yeah. Exactly, there were car accidents. Or just the the diseases that weren't able to be treated, or like you know, people who might have taken their own lives from the depression in the years that followed. Like it's all yep. kinds of residual effects. They stay gone. Did Hulk think about all of those when he snapped no. everyone back safely? Probably not. He's he, he's thinking about like, do they sell triple extra large cardigans? That technically is all of those kind of categories, those high level things. But I also asked in our Discord if anybody had some specific questions so staying here on this family theme for a second somebody was like well what about the conjoined twins do they go away together do they come back together this is really tough if it is separate you know you would say that they have two souls and if we think this is soul stone based right, then the soul right. is counting them as two people a lot of times conjoined twins share organs and oh. Thanos isn't really thinking when he snaps Okay, let's give one of those all of the organs, and the other one, let's say that one doesn't own any of the organs, it just rents. If one does dust away, first of all, that one goes to dust. This one who remains dies most likely shortly after if they are vital organs, their liver is suddenly gone or their heart is suddenly gone, right? So this one dusts away, and then the blip happens and the other one comes back but they are missing vital organs because the other one died years ago, five years ago. So now they immediately die too. I'm mad at the person who asked this question. <laughs> that was Ruby on Discord. I like you, Ruby. I'm mad that you asked it. 
But I will give you that it is possible that if we just, you have to, it's going to be bad news either way, but if we say conjoined twins have no soul, or they, or they only share one, then you could see that the snap looks at it in a scientific way, and it's like, well, they share an outer layer of skin, they share uh, blood vessels, they share DNA, cells interchange between the two of them. It could see them as one entity and snap them all away and snap it all back or blip mm. it all back. Ooh, we got to hope for that one, but in that one, again, they're sharing one soul at best. Another uh, uh, weirdo question here. This one's from Marius Imperfectus from our Discord. I was like, well, what about the people with a life sentence? If they get blipped back, do they at least now get to go free? There's precedent for this. This happened in Iowa a few years ago. Someone was de declared legally dead for a, a minute, and they argued, I died and my sentence literally said life. And the court found, no, funny, good idea, but no, you are back in prison. Yeah, no loopholes on a life sentence. Yeah, if you wake up in your grave, they're, they're going to dig you back up and put you back inside. Well, and they didn't die when they dusted. They were just, like, erased Well, they thought they did. Yeah, they thought they did. We're dead! We're on the phone, but we're dead! Yeah, they'd be brought back, especially for them, it was instantaneous, right? Like, yeah. from their perspective, nothing happened. Now, there's a decent chance that person just ended up back in their cell and didn't, didn't notice. Yeah. But if they didn't end up in their cell for some reason, then they were definitely would be sending those trucks around Elian Gonzalez and once he picked up criminal and the other skeleton in there too and a cello player and then finally uh Cody asked this is the one she's wondered about the most uh, she says what about pregnant women and their babies oh god what if only the baby was snapped and not the mom would the mom suddenly become pregnant again five years later ugh gross so this is one of the most controversial complicated thought processes I've had in answering anything on this show. The answer depends on whether or not you believe that Thanos is pro-life or pro-choice. Does his opinion matter or is it like, is it, it what does, the, I think. the Living Tribunal is pro-life or pro-choice? It depends on, on his mindset when he did it in the moment, the All same right. way that they say that Hulk's mindset made sure everyone was safe. Well, then Thanos' mindset comes into play. Okay. So I don't think it's a surprise to say Thanos He's not pro-life, right? Like, that's kind of his whole thing, right? Well, well, we're also framing it pro-life, or it should be pro-choice and anti-choice, right? Like, by calling it pro-life, that's that's just the, the term they chose to say we're pro-life, but really we're just talking about abortion, not life. Just the matter of abortion. Well, it makes my argument easier if I say pro-life, so I'm going to okay, keep okay. saying it. But his whole argument is that it is worth killing half the life in the universe because there aren't enough resources to fill the bellies of the already living or the people to be left behind. So to him, it could be a pro-life choice with literally the word life. And he's still saying, nah, I choose to kill half the life to fill those bellies. So in other words, he makes a choice to prevent a potential life from existing any further if it means that it would be born into a universe of suffering and non-full bellies. I am so uncomfortable with this line of thinking. I know. The dude would definitely be on the pro-choice argument with the logic that you could add on that life then probably begins at birth when the individual creature's need for resources and consuming them counts against that new little baby individual because previously when it was in its mommy and she was eating those resources that counted as a resource consumption person now it's two units so this person has to stand alone and justify their own life and if that made you way too uncomfortable and you are real mad now pretend i didn't say any of that and i'll just give you this argument bucky's arm bucky's arm dusts away along with bucky Right. And that's because we've since learned because of this mindset and the way he defined an individual, if it's part of your identity, it's something that you see as part of yourself, then it also dusts away too. And it's very likely that a pregnant woman, while that baby's in there, feels like that baby's as much part of her, at least as much part of her, as Falcon's wings are to him. Mm. So... In this case, it's most likely that a pregnant mother and the unborn child are treated as a package deal. They're both dusted or they both get blipped, they both come back. So no creepy suddenly being eight months pregnant five years later and that's just not good for anyone. That's definitely a more convenient way to think about it though. In The Leftovers, a woman has a baby have sudden departure from her womb. That is something that some other creative has, has speculated on and it's horrible and it, it traumatizes everyone involved. 
Uh, but, but in the leftovers, they left their clothes behind, right? I don't know. I don't think I don't we might be thinking of um, of War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise or in Left Behind, right? Left Behind, their clothes are left behind. That's right. That's right. So, uh, sodomy, Gamora, my daughters. Uh, I I hope I I did you proud. It's way worse to bring everyone back. Agreed. The reason I said Tony Stark could be a terrorist is because he was so protective of his family unit that he said, "Don't change anything else." Just bring the people back five years later. Don't undo it all. Just make us deal with those ramifications of homelessness and starvation and just uncomfortable people pooping on top of another person that's already pooping. But Hulk's the one who pulled the trigger. It was Bruce Banner who did it. He's the terrorist. He's the one who's He was following back. orders. <laughs> it's just following orders. <laughs> He's got a simple brain and he's just like, safely? Safely? Hopefully? Oh my god. What a, what a horrible decision the Avengers made. Becoming Smart Hulk is probably still dumber than just normal Bruce Banner. Because you're clumsy and why would yeah. you want to live like that? You can't ever put on socks again. I'm a tall little person. Like, <laughs> mm, just medium. No! System. No! I, I think uh, young Thanos from 2014 who, who they fighted the finale of Avengers Endgame, he's the one who had it right. He's like, you know what? This is such a freaking mess now. I'm just yeah. going to tear the universe to shreds and start over and they won't know anything that happened. <laughs> Never tell them. <laughs> Never tell them. Yeah, it's a miserable place. It's no wonder that they have to skip a lot of time and just kind of let stuff get figured out off screen. All right, Eric, I ate up all of the time. So I'm going <laughs> to give you one bite-sized question. Okay, fair enough. This question comes from Monster Man Alex on our Discord. Uh, in Lost, you got another Lost question. Yes! Why do people think the Flash sideways is purgatory? Uh, yeah, I saw this and I, I get your frustration, Alex, because yeah, a lot of people, I think, oversimplify the final season of Lost. What the f happened? I don't remember where you stand on this, Philip. I thought it was, uh, was underappreciated. I thought the final season of Lost yeah. was fine. But just to remind people, in the final season of Lost, all of reality split into two parallel timelines. We weren't really sure what was going on. It was kind of a Schrodinger experiment. We had the main events on the island where they condensed all the time travel crap on the island. They're all in the present. And then like a flash sideways hypothetical timeline in which Oceanic 815 never crashed. Like they landed at LAX and they all have these like different lives. Like Jack has a son. But then the finale episode reveals that that flash sideways timeline was really this like cosmic limbo realm that existed outside of time. It was created so that all of these souls could find each other and reconnect before they move on to the next phase, you know, to remember and to let go. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I think a lot of people hated this is because earlier in the series, the Lost Riders were adamant that the island is not purgatory. You know, being on this island is a metaphor, and it is that in some ways, so I, I like that, but it, you know, that it isn't literally what it is. That was like the big fan theory that they were asked from season one, and they're like, no, it's not purgatory. And it was that tone that a lot of people were like, Okay, so they must have something completely different in mind that's right. not at all religious. It's not going to be this other realm that's similar to purgatory because they were so in denial about it being purgatory. They were like, it's purgatory, right? They're all dead. And we kept saying, we swear to God, they are not all dead. And while this whole thing, what ended up being, it isn't exactly purgatory. No one calls it purgatory, especially based off of what we know about purgatory from Catholic theology and Dante's Divine Comedy. The concept of purgatory is more of a something rooted in Catholicism, and all of Catholicism is, is metaphorical and interpretive. It's not one of the literalist branches of Christianity by any means. So it, it is kind of like a, a poetic interpretation of what might happen with certain souls when they die. So the fact that this finale is kind of that, and it took place in a church, like the final scene was in a church. There was imagery from a lot of denominations. There was Judeo-Christian stuff. There was there was a lot of different imagery in there, but it was in a church. They were sitting in pews. Like for a lot of people, that is undeniably purgatory. This idea of you're gonna have like an additional life to work off some of the problems with your soul and to work through some of your ongoing problems. That is by definition, in a lot of people's minds, purgatory, or at least it's too close to what people understand purgatory to be, that they felt misled by the writers. And Damon Lindelof, the, the Lost co showrunner, has later admitted that he wouldn't do anything differently with the way they wrote Lost. They could have been better about expectation management, and that some of the problems with Lost 
were some of the, the mysteries and promises that they made on the fringes of the show as opposed to what story they were actually telling. That they created this whole other meta narrative that fans started to, to latch on to and that took over the show. And that was honestly by their own mistakes for doing that. Yeah. Um, and Lindelof, like a lot of people say, oh he sucks. This guy has went on to do The Leftovers, which if you're into like the snap locations and blip, blip locations, The Leftovers is amazing. And Watchmen. Like this guy's a really, really good TV showrunner, but he uh, he definitely stumbled in some ways on Lost, including the promises they made with that final season. And he was kind of abandoned, right? It wasn't even his idea initially. It was a J.J. Abrams show and then he left. It was. J.J. Abrams yeah. did set up a lot of those mysteries from early on, but it was Damon those... Lindelof who said it was not purgatory. Yeah, but I'll also say, and it is purgatory, and that's the answer to the question is that that's why people think it's purgatory it's all real it all happened everything happened i'll also just remind you in terms of where i land on it the issue isn't that it's an interesting ending and an interesting final season it's that all the other mysteries are kind of just like oh i mean we don't have to answer those and it's right. like those are the ones we spent four seasons on or five seasons on you know yeah it, yeah it's rough all right so that's our bite size uh so then it's time for the question box yes the grid cube of questions. Sometimes Why they're not raised as questions. They're just statements that we have thoughts on. This one is scratched onto a Clorox wipe. There's so many other things you could use that for. If I had a black light, this would look like a Jackson Pollock painting. This person wants to know, to either of us, have you ever been, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, have you ever been stuck in a holding pattern? Mm. And if so, what did you do to get out of it? I'll add, successfully or unsuccessfully. Um, I had to look up uh, actually a while ago what a holding pattern was, because I just imagine like, you're just like holding your nuts as you're trying to figure out what to do next. Like, ooh, what do we in do? A, in a pattern combination, left, left, right, right, up, up, down, down. Like you're naked in the middle of like a crowded city block and you're like, oh, where do I go now? Which door do I try? A uh, holding pattern is like when a plane is just circling over an airport and they're like, you can't land yet. So just kind of hang out here and then we'll tell you where to land. And the pilot's just holding his nuts. And he's holding his nuts. Ooh, what do we do? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you feel this way too, Philip. Like it's been a lot of parts of my life where looking back on it, I was like, I was between phases there and I was just kind of like drifting and I didn't really know what the next move was, but like, there's always somewhere where you land on the other side of it. And the go-to period for my life is like in 2015, my apartment burned. I was suddenly homeless. It was a building next door. Uh, it was a construction site, went up in a matter of seconds. There's a huge drought, so everything was super dry. And then our apartment was completely unlivable. And I was in this weird place where I was completely stable, uh, had the same job, the same routine for like years and years. And then suddenly I was homeless. Really, I was fine. I was able to salvage a lot of my stuff. I, I didn't get injured. No one I knew got hurt or, or died, thank God. But the worst part of it was I was just in this like, a floaty space where it's like okay well I know I'm gonna find a place to live but it's like halfway through the month so I'm gonna have to sleep on people's couches for like three weeks and all right I'll just figure it out I guess and I gotta get all new stuff and uh, you know so it's just like uh, it just sucked because like I I didn't I wasn't hurt so bad that like I could really complain to people every conversation I was in I was like well it could have been worse. It could have been worse. Yeah, I could have died, yeah. Yeah, so like, I just hated being in that pattern of just like having the same conversation over and over again. I'm fine, I'm okay. And I didn't deal with it properly, really. Like, I probably should have yeah. gotten help. Yeah, I mean, it was a trauma. It was a trauma, but like, I feel like I'm not waking up in the middle of the night. I didn't fully understand what stress and anxiety are, I think, at the time. I didn't understand that like, anxiety is this creeping thing that just like, is always with you and it twists your emotions in a way that attack you and you feel guilty for feeling certain ways, and that is a form of anxiety. So the way I processed that at the time is I wrote this long essay that just like processed all of my feelings on it, this whole like three week period, and you know, just like thanking everyone for helping me out. And then shortly after that, I did something I don't normally do. I went out to a friend's birthday party at a bar. I don't normally like going to bars for birthdays, like especially if they're like in a part of town I don't normally go to. Yeah. I don't, I, it reminds I just, you of your childhood. Yeah, I, I grew up at a bar, I lived in a bar. I was Don Draper essentially, lived in a brothel. <laughs> but just doing that, I ended up meeting a girl who I'm no longer, this is a completely different girlfriend years ago. But because like, at that point in my life, I felt like I wasn't allowed to get nice things because they might burn. Like I, I, I was wow. in this weird state that like, I was super immamaterial and I was like, I'm not gonna get nice clothes because like, I don't wanna have to just like pay for something expensive I might lose, yeah. So I was yeah. just like, 
I was in this place where I felt like I didn't deserve nice things. So the first attention I got, like I latched on to this person thinking that she was going to like rescue. I was like a rescue dog. I was like, yes, please. Uh, and I was in this like, it wasn't a terrible toxic relationship or anything, but we were not right for each other. And it was like the first like serious relationship I was in for a while. And I found out, like, other things later, she's, like, a truther, an anti-vaxxer, like, all these things that are, like... I just knew she liked Superman a lot. <laughs> I, I worked through those, I just ignored those things, wow. thinking, like, this is, like, my life now. Because I didn't fully process, like, this big uh, revolutionary thing in my life. Luckily, it ended. She ended it. <laughs> you know, kudos to her for recognizing that it wasn't right. And uh, I went through a period of depression after that, and I did properly deal with it. But then I ended up, like understanding the the fleeting nature of home and i ended up turning that into like the best movie script i've ever written um this whole idea of like you can't really ever go home again so like home like asgard is a people not a place basically i i ragnarok myself my home burned down That's... and then i ended up uh getting gaining weight and then uh i was fine on the other side of it that's funny that's eric that's you don't know this that's the theme of the current script i'm working on oh exactly that phrase you can never go home again yeah we we all we all get there right yeah yeah exactly you feel it at some point uh really telling the way you just descri described anxiety a moment ago the the guilt you you had over your own thoughts yeah right it's not just the invasive thoughts it's then feeling terrible about them which is just a spiral that, that right. you fall down yeah yeah it's like me for feeling this way i don't deserve to feel exactly. this way because my life is relatively fine but yeah my thoughts aren't valid my right. feelings aren't valid yeah, yeah yeah suffering is relative though you know i think that's what yeah. people gotta remember like your inner pain is valid and you need to you need to work through it you know you can't just ignore yeah. it i had a, a different story that i was thinking of where uh, about like trying to move out to la and how hard that was but you, you just reminded me of, I, I've kind of hinted at this before, but it's kind of more true uh, than the other story I was going to tell. But there was a time in college, I knew you then, I just wasn't too public about it, where I was 100% homeless. I oh, yeah. had nowhere to live uh, for, for months. And I did a little bit of couch to couch. And I literally slept in Walmart. Uh, I slept in a tent. Um, really? When, when I could, yeah. In the in the twenty four, because it was only twenty four hour place, what? and so there was nowhere to be uh, that you could be up that late. So yeah, I would go into Walmart and I and I would uh, see the greeter, and I would say, "You would be gone in the snap." Uh, and they were like, "What is the snap?" And I was like, "It's a dance craze." But no, I uh, yeah, I would try to sleep in the tent, try not to get caught. I, I usually didn't. And then eventually, one of uh, I, I just another friend who like knew how bad shape I was in. Let she was like, "I don't have space, but I have a car," and so she let me live in her car for a while. And so that was just absolutely like a very dark stretch of time. But also, I mean, talk about a holding pattern, right? I was, I, I also, I, I was kicked out of school because I couldn't pay for it anymore. Yeah, um, yeah. So I was just like, so what do I even, what do I even do? Like, I, I know I shouldn't go back to Miami because that's what put my family in a situation where I'm in this situation and I'm trying to escape that. Mm. So if I go back there, I'm just going to relive these same mistakes and lead to the same thing. So it's like, I can't go back, but I also can't go forward. I literally can't afford to. So then I started doing this thing where, because I had nowhere to go at night, I had nowhere to go during the day, but during the day, even though I was technically kicked out of school, I would just go to lecture halls and just sit in on classes that were like in that lecture hall all day. So like the one in Weimar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would take classes that I wasn't taking and just that, but that I was just like interested in. One of them was uh, television in American society, um, which oh, you might yeah. remember that class. Yeah, I remember. yeah. And I was like vaguely getting interested in becoming a writer or working in TV and media and things like that. And so I was like, you know what? They don't, they're not checking ID at the yeah, door. Yeah, uh, sit in the lecture hall. No one yet. cares. Idiots. Yeah, uh, they are now. Uh, that's the same uh, lecture hall that I puked in that one time. I think the stain uh, is still but, there. Oh, they had to tear out the floor. Um, but, uh, I, I would sit in there and I would take notes because I was like, you know, studying to learn the content of the class uh, and I would ask questions and everything. And I was like, say I'm a student in this class, I would have this question. And then eventually, I guess like there was this girl who actually ended up becoming a really good one of our friends, but she would notice I, that I was taking all these great notes. And so she started asking for my notes and then other people would ask for my notes. And then I got, I, I, got, I have a little, uh, little devil on my shoulder and then I have a dollar sign on the other shoulder. And, <laughs> They come together sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, I could sell these notes. So I started selling my notes to the class that I wasn't even taking. And then, you know, in order to make some real money with this, because I got to think, you know, you got to scale. That's the important thing. That's right. Remember, money is the most important thing. That's yeah. what I've always been taught. 
uh, money and then breakfast. So I started selling my notes to a tutoring company that helped people study for the exams. Uh, so they would sell like my notes and I was being, I was a published writer all of a sudden yeah. and I was so excited about this. Uh, it started going so well, I started making the most money I'd ever made, which is nothing still. Yeah, it was just true. Gainesville, Florida, yeah. college student, but yeah. enough money where I was able to afford a bedroom in somebody's house. So I suddenly like wasn't homeless anymore. Uh, I got you a job doing the same That's right. thing. That's right. I worked there for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and you used it to buy a new Rolex. Uh, <laughs> it burned. <laughs> it started the fire. I, I tried to live in the box that it came in. But so I did kind of like start to, to relive this life. And then I never actually got to sign up for classes again because they were so expensive. But I was still doing that thing where I was kind of fake going to classes. And then I realized I have access in that same college to equipment through friends that I could I could kind of steal but kind of borrow the equipment. And then so that's what ended up happening at the end of our time at UF where I kind of created a film major that they didn't have mm -hmm. and a comedy major that they didn't have. And I used all their facilities and all their equipment. I had a job. So I like milked that school for as much as I could do. Good. But Good on it, you. honestly, I, I felt like I needed that, that money back. And I got out of the rut that I was in by, you know, I think I'd been waiting for somebody to pull me out, like my family to show up and rescue me or something. But instead I just like found these ways to kind of make my own opportunities and then you know, build a ladder with them to climb out of it myself. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's the same thing that I even do now. That's, that's what New Rockstars was. You, like, that's the, one of the only ways out is kind of your, like, doing it yourself. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You have, and, and, but I also, I'm going to say before, you know, I hope that some people, like, do think that, because I'm very aggressive about the amount of control you have over your own life and power you have. But I think this is actually a good segue, because sometimes you still feel powerless anyway it and it's it's not it is harder than just uh, you need to buck up and and put your life together or something right um so we we were, we've been talking about when we wanted to do this and it just feels like an important thing to say while we're going through all of this um together but also separately so we just want to talk about um just kind of what's going on in the world but also just this thing that it's it's probably more important than ever that you be spending time with each other in whatever way you can. Yeah, like for everyone watching, this is like the perfect time to text, not just a friend that you are already texting or the coworker you're still kind of working with remotely, but text a friend you haven't seen in a while or, you know, you do it yourself, schedule the Zoom happy hour, uh, right. Just you make know. it happen. Or call Do your the mom. Jackbox games. Everyone, call your oh. mom, please. Play Jackbox with your mom. Her, her <laughs> It'd be answers hilarious. are so funny, um, so dirty. Yeah, just let the people in your life know that you're thinking about them. And also, if that you need them. Somebody messaged me today saying that they they just needed to let somebody know that they weren't doing great. I was like, I, I'm I, like, that's brave to to tell me, and I'm I'm like happy that you are brave enough to admit that to yourself because that's the first step the next thing is now seeking help if it turns out you can't help right. yourself i have here if, if you feel like there's nobody to help you uh it's i think it's nami is the way they say it but the uh, nami yeah. it's the nation's largest grassroots version of, of a mental health organization um and they can help get you support if you need it they can teach you how to be a support system for other people yeah. if you just want to find another way to help yeah. may which we're technically kind of done with whatever but this was mental health awareness month is one of the reasons why we want to talk about this and uh nami just has a ton of great resources for dealing with mental health issues especially right now in the current state of everything so you can go to nami.org so we'll put the website on the screen but it's nami.org uh or you can also call 1-800-950-nami which is 6264 the 1-800-950-6264, just call them. It, it's like super easy and yeah. just, it's nice to talk to somebody. You're not alone, even that's though right. it feels like it. Yeah, that's right. All right, well, uh, I think that's a great place to wrap things up for this week. Uh, that is our show. So reminder that you can join our official Discord by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. And you can get audio versions of the show by subscribing to New Rockstars Big Question wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks so much to everyone who submitted questions this week. If you, we didn't get your question in this week, we'll definitely uh, get it on in a future week. You can send us your big questions on Twitter using the hashtag big question by mailing us at our P.O. Box. Or, yeah, joining us on Discord. That's probably where we're going to see your question mm -hmm. first. You can follow me at EA Voss. Follow Philip at Philip Molina and follow New Rockstars on social media and subscribe here on YouTube to get too much information on all the stuff that you care about. Thanks everyone. See you next week. Take care of yourselves. Call That's your mom. Right. Call your mom. She's hilarious. She's so funny. <laughs>